So today I'm going to talk a little bit about HIV free exposure prophylaxis, also um, known as PrEP, um, and specifically kind of current landscape of PrEP use in addiction medicine, um, maybe some of the barriers that we see in accessing PrEP and prescribing PrEP, and then potentially some solutions. A lot of this is also applicable to primary care settings as well, or kind of highly um, clinical settings. So I have no disclosures. Um, just a few learning objectives for today. So we're going to identify HIV and PrEP trends um, impacting the care of people who inject drugs specifically and people who, who use drugs in general. We'll touch on some disparities in HIV prevention and care. We'll go over some components of HIV prevention in people who inject drugs. And then we're going to talk about some of the PrEP medications specifically, current guidelines, prescribing, and monitoring. I'm also going to go briefly over part of um, a survey of addiction medicine clinicians that was part of my uh, fellowship scholarly project. And then we're also going to talk about measures to increase PrEP use in people who inject drugs and use substances. And then hopefully if there's a little bit of time, we'll um, go through a case or two. So what do we know about kind of current uh, PrEP use um, now, so we do know that people who inject drugs um, really are disproportionately affected by HIV. Um, it's estimated that globally, um, approximately 20% of people who inject drugs are living with HIV. Um, in the United States, um, approximately 10% of new infections are attributed to injection drug use. And that new HIV diagnoses among people who inject drugs are increasing. Um, for instance, in, from the period of 2016 to 2019, there was a 13% increase in HIV diagnoses among people who ingest drugs. In Wisconsin specifically, about 10% of new cases of HIV are attributed to injection drug use or both injection drug use and male-male sexual contact. Um, we also know that PrEP use uh, despite, despite there being a significant um, risk um, in people who inject drugs, really lags way far behind what we see used in other groups. And kind of most data that we have estimates less than 1% to 3% in uh, use in people who inject drugs. Um, you know, this there are a lot of disparities that really do still exist when it comes to HIV prevention screening and treatment. And, you know, this is probably due to a multitude of factors, including structural and social factors, um, including housing, um, involvement in the cr criminal legal system, poverty, discrimination, stigma, and access, um, to name a few. There's also not a ton of data that really looks at or identifies concrete strategies to improve PrEP uptake um, and sustain PrEP use among people who inject drugs, although data is emerging in, in process, so that's good. Um, and then we also know that, as with other many other things in healthcare interventions, you know, really trying to address some of the barriers to care can improve PrEP uptake. So what do we know about the lifetime risk of HIV infection, specifically among people who inject drugs? Um, we certainly know that it's higher. Um, and I think this table is also very telling and it really points out some of the significant disparities that we still see, um, specifically in Black and African American uh, individuals, um, you can see one in seven lifetime risk of HIV in black, uh, women, um, who inject drugs. Um, also, uh, Latinx, Hispanic folks, um, American Indian and Alaska Native. And, you know, this is important as with many other things in healthcare, really for any um, intervention to be effective, we need to be able to address some of these underlying disparities. So specifically looking at HIV and 
difference. And again, previously I mentioned that approximately 10% of uh, new HIV diagnoses are attributed to injection drug use in Wisconsin. Um, while, you know, male-male sexual contact, MSM, is the primary risk factor, or I would say most common HIV transmission risk, it's not just um, male-male sexual contact, right? Injection drug use is there and something that we're seeing. Um, it really just emphasizes the point that we need to be pay attention. We need to try and pay attention to this uh, population as well. Um, I'm going to explain this a little bit. So this uh, map is from something called MapAIDSView.org, and the um, URL is there at the bottom. And it, it's actually, I think, a very informative and telling source. There are a lot of different variables that you can look at that are kept uh, that reflect HIV um, data in the United States, and you can narrow it down to region. So I encourage you to take a closer look at the site if you have interest. But this variable specifically is something that's called the prep to need ratio. And this is something that I just learned about in the last year as part of my project. But essentially, um, the, this is a ratio of PrEP users in 2021 to the number of people newly diagnosed with HIV in 2020. And a lower ratio, a lower PrEP to need ratio basically equates more unmet need with the lighter area, the white area is reflecting lower ratios on this on this map, um, depicting uh, more unmet need for PrEP. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of white and light green um, throughout the United States, um, including Wisconsin, which basically demonstrates there's really a profound underutilization of, of PrEP throughout the U.S. Um, that certainly has some regional variations as well. And then looking specifically at, um, you know, closer at Wisconsin, the PrEP to need ratio, um, basically what you can see from this graph is that while the PrEP to need ratio has improved over the last approximate decade or so, um, meaning more people are accessing PrEP that could likely benefit from PrEP, there, there still are a lot of disparities, very similar to the ones that I mentioned before, and um, reflects what we're seeing a lot throughout the United States. But in Wisconsin, this is really based on sex, gender, and race primarily, um, and unmet need for PrEP remains highest among African-American, Black individuals, Latinx, Hispanics, um, and females compared to males. So moving on, um, just to kind of touch on um, HIV testing and screening, because we know that testing and, treat and treatment are important as preventive measures. Um, almost 40% of new HIV infections are transmitted by individuals who do not know that they um, are infected with HIV. Um, for example, in, in the US in 2019, 13% or one in seven of individuals were unaware of their diagnosis at the time. And again, this is really important because the treatment that we that we have for HIV is now very extremely effective. And um, this goes along the lines with wh what is termed U equals U, essentially undetectable equals untransmittable. Again, so testing and treatment as prevention. Um, it's also, um, you know, recommended by the CDC and the USPSTF that uh, HIV testing is done at least once in a lifetime for essentially all adults, and then annually for those who may have a higher risk, including people who inject drugs. So, what what exactly is HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis? So, there's kind of different definitions and ways to look at it, but essentially it's a medication for HIV negative individuals that can help prevent HIV transmission. Um, the first medication for PrEP uh, approved in the United States was in 2012. Um, it's also termed a biomedical intervention that can be part of a larger prevention kind of toolkit, so to speak, or what a lot of us would think of as harm reduction. 
um, which is obviously something that we really keep an eye to in um, addiction medicine as well as primary care. Um, I think PrEP can also be a really an opportunity to reduce some of those HIV disparities that we just touched on. Um, it could potentially be a gateway to accessing other healthcare services, including substance use disorder treatment um, or primary care or preventative care. And we also know that PrEP is really effective. Uh, when it's taken consistently, it can reduce the risk of HIV transmission by um, up to 99%. So very effective. And then who are kind of the groups of people um, individuals that may benefit from PrEP. Um, and there's kind of like a few main buckets. Um, so number one is really anyone who self-identifies the need for PrEP, and I'll touch on this in a minute uh, as far as um, recommendations from the CDC, the most recent recommendations. Um, the one we all more commonly know about is um, some men who have sex with men who may be at higher risk. Um, we know that people um, with partners with or at risk for HIV could benefit, benefit from PrEP. Transgender women at are, are at much higher risk. Um, anyone who's had an STI, condomless, um, receptive anal sex or transactional sex. And then people who inject drugs or use stimulants like methamphetamine, especially during sex. Um, the bottom part is just um, a copy of the most current USP TSF um, recommendations, which is a grade A recommendation for um, prescribing PrEP. Um, it's actually in process, but from what I've heard, it's not anticipated that there will be many um, updates or changes to, to this one. Um, this is from the CDC guidelines that were just updated in 2021. I think the previous guidelines were from 2017. And there's a few kind of key updates um, to these guidelines. One is uh, the recommendation, kind of global recommendation to inform all sexually active adults and adolescents about PrEP. There are also simplified indications for PrEP. Um, some of the prior indications from the previous guidelines were a little um, left open for interpretation. Um, this is straight, more straightforward, which is always helpful, I think. Um, it also um, has a recommendation uh, to recommend or offer prep for all, for all individuals with sexual and or injection related risk. And then a recommendation to prescribe prep if it's requested, regardless of uh, identified risk factors. So if someone requests PrEP, we really should consider prescribing PrEP, presuming there aren't other contraindications. You know, some people may not feel comfortable disclosing all of their sexual practices or substance use injection practices, especially when meeting a healthcare provider for the first time. Um, and then finally, in these, these most recent guidelines, there's um, information on cabotegravir, which is the long-acting um, injectable form of PrEP that I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, the two arrows on here, the red arrow, again, is just emphasizing um, the at-risk group of people who inject drugs. So that can be anyone who is injecting um, and potentially sharing any type of injection equipment doesn't necessarily have to be needle, needles or syringes. It can be other equipment like cookers or spoons or cottons. Um, and then anyone with a HIV positive injecting partner. Um, and then the yellow arrow is really, again, emphasizing that, um, you know, many or most people who inject drugs are also probably sexually active. So um, they should really be assessed for sexual risk as well as um, substance use and injection-related risk for HIV uh, acquisition. Um, same thing here with the red circle, just emphasizing we, you know, we really should be asking people about sexual risks as well. Um, and then the light green boxes um, noting that prescribing PrEP if requested is recommended, again, presuming there aren't any contraindications to the medication. Um, 
the other thing is, you know, research really does tell us that use of really any substance use, not necessarily just injection use, so this would include alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, opioids, even inhalants, um, can be associated with increased sexual behaviors that may be associated with increased risk for HIV um, transmission. And this could be to, due to behavioral disinhibition, um, condomless sex, potentially transactional sex, um, and that overlapping risks often uh, occur. Um, so again, important to, to really kind of assess the whole picture. I think um, a lot of the time we segregate issues of substance use from other aspects of HIV prevention um, or and definitely from other aspects of, of health care in general. And I think kind of thinking of it in a harm reduction way of how can we um, make sure folks are staying as safe as possible with within the context of, of said behavior or behaviors um, has been a helpful way for me to think about it. So moving on to some more nuts and bolts of the, med the PrEP medications themselves. Essentially, there are three. Um, and I'm going to go in order of when they were FDA approved. So the first was approved in 2012, and this is tenofovir intracytabine, also known as TDF or F uh, TDF FTC brand name Truvada's, what we all have heard of. Um, it's a once daily tablet. The important thing to know about F, I'm sorry, TDF or Truvada is that it is really approved for everyone who has. Um, indications or is eligible for PrEP. So it can be prescribed for every group, all sexually active individuals, um, whether they're, you know, um, men who have sex with men or heterosexual or transgender or non-binary, um, as well as people who inject drugs. The other thing is uh, this medication is now in a generic form, which is great. Um, the second medication um, is TAF FTC, so it differs just slightly. The tenofovir uh, is a slightly different formulation, and I don't know more than other than that. Um, and then the same uh, second medication, intracytabine, um, with brand name Discovy. This was approved a little bit uh, just a few years ago in 2019. It's also a once daily tablet. Important thing to know about. TAF or Discovy is that it is indicated for men who have sex with men, so cisgender men who have sex with men, and transgender women. So it really excludes individuals who are at risk of HIV infection from receptive vaginal um, intercourse. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then the, the last medication just approved a couple years ago um, is called cabotegravir or CAB, brand name Apertude. This is an injectable intramuscular long acting medication. You give the first dose, um, then you give the second dose one month later, and then it's a bi monthly injection, so every two months. This is improved for cisgender men who have sex with men and transgender women, so similar to TAP or Discovy. Um, the prescribing for all three of these medications is based on weight, not age. So any adolescent or adult weighing at least 35 kilograms is fine. Um, and then I just wanted to note that for cabotegravir, there's really only limited data in um, persons who are pregnant or who desire pregnancy. So it's, it's not uh, approved or recommended for pregnancy at this time. And cabotegravir has also not been studied in people who inject drugs. That being said, if a person who injects drugs or uses substances has sexual related risk, they could potentially be eligible for cabotegravir. Again, part of the importance of assessing sexual risk factors as well as substance use related risk factors. So what are some of the side effects? There aren't a lot actually, I, in my experience, most people and I only have experience prescribing the oral medications. I've never prescribed cabotegravir. Um, most people tolerate uh, PrEP medications quite well. The more common ones we can see are nausea, diarrhea, headache. These are typically mild and do resolve within one month. So 
as we always counsel patients when we're starting a new medication. Um, if the side effects are mild and tolerable, stick with it. Often they're going to go away. Um, there can be renal impairment, and I haven't I haven't seen this a whole lot. I've seen a couple cases where the um, creatinine did bump a little bit. Um, things to note, though, are that it's reversible if the medication is stopped, and the risk is greater with TDF or Truvada. So one thing to keep in mind when prescribing if someone has chronic kidney disease or other significant risk factors or their GFR creatinine clearance is below a certain level, you you wouldn't want to prescribe TDF. You may want to think about um, TAF or Descovy. There can also be a slight, and estimates are 1% or less, loss of bone mineral density over a year without any known increased risk for fractures. The risk um, with this is greater also with TDF or Truvada. It's not recommended, at least at this time, that you know we do baseline DEXA scans or any type of surveillance really for this. It's just something to be aware of. And maybe something to consider if we know that a patient has osteopenia or osteoporosis or they have other significant risk factors for um, osteopenia or osteoporosis, like you know, hyperparathyroidism or a strong family history or something like that. And then you can see some metabolic uh, effects with TAF or Descovy, possible weight gain. The, the amount I could find was average of two to three pounds in some people. And then it can also cause a bump in uh, triglycerides. Um, so it's recommended that you kind of try and keep an eye on uh, lipids if you can. Um, and then injection injection prep or cabotegravir, really just localized injection site reactions that tend to be pretty mild from what I uh, read. So how long does it take for prep to become fully effective? And obviously this is important um, when we're counseling patients um, about starting prep. For TDF or Truvada, we know that in rectal tissue, it's approximately one week, and vaginal tissue, it's approximately 20 days, and then we apply the same to injection drug users, or injection drug use, um, time to effectiveness, about 28, or sorry, 20 days um, to reach uh, optimal serum levels. Um, there really isn't any data on this for TAF or cabotregavir. As far as TAF, um, what I learned was usually to counsel them on the similar time to effectiveness that we see with TDF. Lab monitoring, it's actually really pretty straightforward. Um, and these are the baseline labs that you wanna get. And um, you, you definitely wanna get this within seven days of starting prep. Um, so number one, you gotta get an HIV test. Um, really, this should be a HIV antigen antibody, so fourth generation test. Um, you can consider getting an HIV RNA if you're, you know, if there's concern for infection within the um, preceding month or so. Um, you also want to get hepatitis B and hepatitis C serology. Um, the the reason we, the main reason we screen for hepatitis B prior to prescribing prep. Um, is because tenofovir and, and tricytabine are also used to treat hepatitis B infection. And when, when these meds are discontinued, patients with active hepatitis B infection can um, experience clinically significant hepatitis flares. So that's really the main we, reason we test. Um, it's also good to make sure, you know, that people um, are immune and to vaccinate if they're not and so forth. Um, we do STI testing screening as well, and this includes syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. It's important that for gonorrhea and chlamydia, you, you test the sites based off of potential exposure. So that might be um, a pharyngeal swab uh, as well as a, a rectal swab on some individuals in addition to general urinary. Um, uh, pregnancy test. Um, and then for oral prep, uh, you definitely want to check a creatinine or creatinine clearance as PDS Truvada is contraindicated with a creatinine clearance of less than 60, and then TAF contraindicated with a creatinine clearance of less than 30. So essentially, TAF or Descovy is a little gentler, so to speak, on the kidneys. 
Um, and then as previously mentioned, due to some of the potential metabolic effects, you wanna make sure you have some baseline lipids, um, especially for TAP, before starting TAP or Descobi. And I usually will check lipids if they haven't had any done like within the last year. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go back to this. So um, having active age, uh, hepatitis B infection is not a contraindication to starting PrEP. Um, you can still start it, but you obviously need to counsel the patient and then make sure that they're, um, you know, you're consulting a provider who has experience and knowledge in, in treating hepatitis B. Um, so how often do we get labs and monitoring um, after starting PrEP? Um, you can do a one month kind of check in, um, especially if you're concerned that there may have been exposure in the last month and you want to do another HIV test. Um, this isn't certainly what you need to do for everyone. Um, the big one is really every three months, um, and that's going to coincide with when you're essentially refilling medications and reassessing and counseling. And so you're going to want to do an HIV test and then screen for STIs, which are essentially the same as the ones that I just reviewed, the baseline labs and pregnancy tests, if applicable. And then at six months, people with increased, you know, risk for renal disease, people over the age of 50, maybe with hypertension um, or lower creatinine clearance at baseline, you want to um, check a creatinine. And then every 12 months, cholesterol and hepatitis C for uh, men who have sex with men, transgender women, and people who inject drugs. Then for injectable prep labs, uh, you're going to do labs again at one month, which is going to coincide with the second injection, so essentially an HIV test. And then every two months, which coincides with the subsequent bi-monthly injections, again, um, HIV test. Um, you want to do SCI screening, testing every four months, and then pregnancy um, test as appropriate. Um, so when do you want to follow up? And, uh, and the big takeaway is essentially every three months, and these can be in-person visits. Um, telemedicine is totally appropriate um, for most prep uh, follow-up visits. And um, you're assessing essentially medication adherence, you know, are you having any problems with medication, any side effects? And then the big one is you want to make sure you're assessing each time for any signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection. It's also important for people to know what those signs and symptoms are um, so they can just um, make sure that if they do develop those, that they um, seek evaluation. Um, one week call is optional. It's always nice to check and make sure they didn't have any problems getting the prescription refilled. Um, make sure they're not having any side effects or problems with medication. This can be helpful if there is a person who can be a prep navigator, so to speak. Um, and then one month is optional as well. Um, but really the big the big takeaway is every three months, every 90 days. Um, injectable prep, they essentially recommend again one month, which is the timing of the second injection. Again, assessing for signs and symptoms of acute HIV with each follow-up visit. And then it's every two months. So counseling for PrEP, it's an important part, um, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a little bit longer of a conversation, dialogue, uh, when you're starting PrEP, but you really want to talk to people about the importance of adherence, not only for the medication to be optimally effective, but also to reduce the risk of uh, HIV-resistant strains. Um, you, you obviously want to counsel and make sure that they know that this only protects against HIV, it's important um, if they're wanting protection for other infections that they use condoms or other protection. Um, if applicable, talking about um, safer injection practices. Um, I always want people to know that when we're starting PrEP, this is gonna require, you know, at least uh, every 90 day visit or talking in labs so that they know that upfront. Um, and we can potentially address any barriers at that time um, that we might anticipate in the future. Um, it might be a time opportunity to talk about um, 
reproductive desires and contraception. Again, you want to make sure people know about the symptoms of acute HIV infection. You want to make sure they know it's not good to stop and start the medication due to the risk of resistance, although my understanding is it's actually quite low. Um, there are a lot of insurance and medication assistance programs out there that can be helpful if cost is a concern. And it's my understanding too that every insurance company has to um, cover and have on formulary at least one form of oral prep, um, which is good. So just, there are a few other additional kind of HI prevention um, pharmacotherapies. One is called on-demand prep or 2-on-1 dosing, which I'm gonna go over here in a second. Um, then there's also PEP or post-exposure prophylaxis, which really refers to like occupational risk, like a needle stick, and then non-occupational PEP or NPEP. Um, so on-demand PrEP, you may you may have heard of, or 2-1-1 dosing. It's also known as intermittent, non-daily, event-driven is a common one that I've heard. Um, PrEP, this is essentially taking PrEP only prior to risk or as needed. And the 2-1-1 dosing schedule refers to taking, so a person would take two pills, two to 24 hours after, I'm sorry, before sex. So obviously you kind of have to be able to anticipate um, when that's gonna be, the person has to be able to anticipate when that's gonna be. And then you take one pill 24 hours after the first dose and one pill 24 hours after the second dose and you're, and you're kind of done with the regimen for that time. There is good evidence that 2-1-1 dosing provides effective protection for men who have sex with men. Um, the efficacy is unknown for heterosexual individuals, people who inject drugs, or transgender um, persons. Um, and so there are quite a few health organizations in the United States, Canada, and Europe who, offer, who do offer guidance for um, 2 one one dosing or on-demand PrEP as an alternative to taking PrEP daily. Again, um, for men who have sex with, with men at risk for HIV. Um, and while updated, you know, guidelines provide information on this type of dosing schedule, it's not yet approved by the FDA or recommended by the CDC. Um, it may be in the future. Um, but I've, I've had Patients ask me specifically about 2-1-1 dosing, so I think it's um, important and helpful to know what it is and when it can be um, helpful. So I mentioned NPEP or non-occupational post-exposure exposure prophylaxis um, previously. So this is for a person who has had a known or potential exposure to HIV within a, and you're within that 72 hour window of exposure. So the big things are known or really kind of high risk exposure in 72 hours um, is when you would think about in PEP. There's baseline labs. They're essentially the same as for PrEP. Um, obviously, if HIV is reactive, you don't want to start in PEP. You want to get them to a HIV specialist for care. Um, you also don't have to wait for the HIV test to result, understanding that before you start in PEP, understanding that many of us may not have access in our clinical space to rapid HIV testing. Um, the medications for NPAP, NPAP are listed here. The big one is basically it's TDF or Truvada plus another medication, and it's for 28 days. So, um, and it's I prescribe in PEP a few times. Everyone was insured. Um, my understanding is every insurance has to cover in PEP as well. Um, that being being said, we do know that prior authorizations are a very real thing. Um, I'm not gonna. There's another. So the bottom um, medication. Um, is an, an option if for some reason you can't prescribe TDF, you can use uh, TAP in place. 
And then if a person is prescribed and takes NPEP, you want to follow up um, ideally and do a, a retest for HIV at four to six weeks, three months, and six months. So kind of moving on and talking about some of the barriers to PrEP and um, it's pretty convoluted and complicated and there are a, a lot of potential barriers at a lot of different levels. I like this slide because it really, I think, breaks it down. Um, and I adapted this from two of our former um, LGBTQ plus uh, fellows from, from their fellowship presentation last year, um, Dr. Dowd and Dr. Gergen. Um, so if we look at individual community level, there can definitely be a lack of awareness of HIV risk or just lack of awareness of PrEP itself. Um, sometimes kind of risk benefit perceptions can be skewed one way or the other. Um, at the clinic level, clinical level access can be a huge issue. Um, at the kind of systems level, um, Supporting providers in, cl in clinics in prescribing and offering PrEP um, can be a challenge. Uh, patient navigation services can be helpful, but sometimes they can limit who is accessing press, PrEP. So that's something to think about as well. And then really at the kind of clinician provider level, just uh, knowledge of PrEP, when to talk about it, how to talk about it, how to prescribe it can all be um, very real challenges as well. Um, and then the last one that I added was stigma. And um, as we see with stigma with addiction and substance use disorder, there certainly can, there's certainly a lot of stigma around HIV itself um, and actually even of taking PrEP. Um, and we can see that kind of at all levels. Another big one I would say here that I'm going to talk about in a little bit would be just kind of competing priorities when it comes to other potential medical or psychosocial issues, which are certainly things that we encounter um, in the in the populations that we care for within addiction medicine. So as part of my fellowship scholarly project, specifically looking at PrEP, um, did a survey of addiction medicine physicians. And so this was, these, the survey was sent um, via email using the Qualtrics survey program. And I'm going to give a shout out to the UW Survey Center. It was extremely helpful and I would not have been able to do, to, do it really effectively without their assistance. Um, it was sent out to via email to um, fellows and faculty of accredited addiction medicine fellowships throughout the United States. Um, and it was sent to pretty much all of the fellowships. Um, and as far as response rate, uh, received 52 responses, completed surveys total, 32 faculty, 20 fellows. Um, the most common primary specialties that were represented uh, among the respondents were family medicine, internal medicine, and then psychiatry. Um, they really came from all different uh, clinical settings. The more common ones that were listed were integrated primary care and addiction medicine clinical like outpatient settings. Um, a lot of, uh, of the clinicians were working in inpatient and outpatient addiction medicine settings and then primary care clinics. Um, the survey consisted of 20, 80 questions total. This included qualitative, quantitative questions, and then some kind of basic demographic um, questions, and then used a uh, Likert scale. Um, and I'm not going to go through the entire survey, but I think I'm going to try and touch on some of the more interesting and telling points. And so this was a question specifically from the survey, how important is HIV prevention education in addiction medicine clinics? And 78% of respondents said very or extremely important. Um, as far as how important PrEP education uh, is in addiction medicine clinical setting, 70% said very or extremely. Um, and then how appropriate is it to provide or prescribe PrEP? And almost 90% said very or extremely appropriate. And then as far as competency, um, 
with prescribing prep, um, 41% said uh, they felt very or extremely competent in prescribing prep. Um, and this is looking at actually how how many of the clinicians prescribe PrEP themselves or referred out. Overwhelmingly, 75% prescribe themselves. Um, and then approximately 70% said that they assessed risk for HIV in the past year. Um, and then, which I found interesting, on, and then quite a bit lower, 40% said they uh, most or uh, most of the time are always uh, assess eligi eligibility for prep, and then we're looking at, at how many times they actually offered prep. It was about fifty or fifty as far as none or a few times, but some or most of the time. And then um, part of the survey, uh, the last few questions were really open to questions about um, challenges that uh, people have run into, and I included these because I also think they're really telling. And these are quotes directly from the survey from clinicians. Uh, as a psychiatrist working in addiction medicine, I do not have the information or training on recommending or pre prescribing PrEP. However, I would like to learn. So again, just kind of um, noting knowledge, comfort with prescribing. Um, I'm used to prescribing PrEP based pur purely on sexual activity. I need to expand my use of other risk factors to better facilitate screening and offering PrEP when indicated. So again, looking at some of those other uh, screening questions with regards to sexual risk factors. Um, I practice in an HIV clinic, so PrEP is high on our radar. Even once monthly injectable cabotegravir can be a challenge for some of our seronegative patients who are not well engaged. And providers are still thinking about PrEP for more, more for sexual than injecting risk. I think people who are coming to the addiction treatment space who are eligible for PrEP tend to be the patients that are harder to retain and engage. Also frequently I find that patients aren't aware about PrEP. So again, patient risk perception, awareness, access, and engagement. I work in the OTP setting and funding is extremely limited. There's also a perception that we are not allowed to deliver general medical services. So again, a, a question of trying to kind of meet people where they're at, where they're already engaged and whether or not we're able to do that or not. A few more challenges noted in my head. I just don't place it on par with active treatment of their disease, similar to the way that I skip colonoscopies with people who have poorly controlled diabetes. It's just not on anyone's radar. I'm a fellow, so I have to follow my attendings lead. I'm also an OBGYN and just getting them to be okay with me prescribing contraception is a challenge. Um, so then kind of talking about, um, I guess, scope of practice and familiarity with prescribing. Um, most of my patients snort or smoke their drugs. PrEP seems to be largely associated with injection drug use. Most patients I see don't report having multiple sexual partners, nor are they MSM, so risk seems pretty low. Maybe I'm just underestimating the risk, though. Again, paying attention to other um, potential overlapping risk factors. As a provider, I would like to be able to provide such services for my patients as HIV prevention is a huge part of harm reduction, no less than overdose prevention. Um, the process is time consuming and at times comes at the cost of discussing and implementing um, MAT. So I, I think some very valid, obviously, points and concerns um, that reflect a lot of what we found in the rest of the survey and what I found in my kind of literature search as well. Many competing priorities, just not thinking about prep, um, skewed risk perception, you know, also pointing out, thinking of it as a harm reduction measure, which we're very attuned to in the addiction medicine space, um, can be helpful. And then some of the very real time constraints that we face as clinicians, um, whether it's in addiction medicine or primary care or a combination of both is, uh, is very real. The most common clinical and provider challenges kind of overall arching things was were uh, other priorities take pre precedence, not enough time, lack of clinical support, and then again, not on radar came up multiple times. 
the most common patient related factors were that were identified. And again, this is coming from addiction medicine clinicians themselves, not patients, but what they perceive were housing insecurity, involvement with the criminal legal system and low risk perception. So on the other hand, what were some of the solutions that were posed by um, addiction medicine um, clinicians on the survey? Increase in admin non-clinical support um, to make sure patients have results, et cetera. Patient handouts could be uh, helpful to give to patients when talking about HIV risk and PrEP. Um, standardized screening and education at new patient visits. And then uh, more education essentially about PrEP, especially in addiction medicine. Uh, again, mentioning more education that is concise and pragmatic, like a one page um, algorithm. And there's actually quite a few out there at the very end of this presentation. Um, in my references, I listed uh, a couple of good ones if you're interested. So how can we go about improving PrEP and use in people who use drugs and people who inject drugs. I think knowledge, um, just gaining knowledge and talking about PrEP uh, more. Um, again, looking at the importance of assessing substance use related risk and sexual related risk. And then kind of looking at some of the structural and logistical barriers, things that have been done or proposed are same day PrEP, um, PEP to PrEP. So starting PrEP after someone has taken um, PEP. Uh, things like having case management um, help, assistance, and prep navigation can be huge. Um, and then really think about kind of integrating HIV prevention with substance use disorder care and harm reduction services. So again, kind of meeting people where they're already coming from care. I think syncing prep visits with substance use disorder care visits makes a lot of sense to me. A lot of times we're seeing these patients every three three months or more frequently. Um, so uh, keeping an eye to that and then tools that can promote better medication adherence and care engagement are always helpful. Um, again, I mentioned already really thinking of PrEP as another harm reduction measure and it could be simply just phrasing and asking a patient, are you interested in hearing more about a medication that can prevent HIV? Um, electronic health record templates can be helpful. There's actually one, a new one, a smart set in a help link that I listed here. Um, I haven't actually used it. I've looked at it and it looks quite user friendly and very helpful. So I encourage you to check that out. And then education can be quite helpful um, for providers, other providers, as well as just team members um, talking about uh, in comfort with taking a sexual health history and counseling, health equity, talking about implicit bias, and maybe even designating a prep captain, so to speak, who is there to kind of help other providers with um, education. So in conclusion, people who inject drugs uh, remain disproportionately affected by HIV and PrEP is underutilized. Um, assessing sexual risk um, in addition to substance use and injection-related risks is important. Um, we really should be considering PrEP for all people who inject drugs who have shared injection equipment of any type in the past six months and or who have sexual related risks. Um, there are quite a few barriers to PrEP initiation um, and continued use, including various different levels as well as stigma um, and often multiple competing needs. And then interventions really kind of trying to address some of these barriers can improve PrEP uptake. Um, including integrating care with substance use disorder treatment and other harm reduction services. And we really still need more research um, to identify uh, some of these strategies um, to improve PrEP use among people who inject drugs and also people who just use substances. These are my references. Um, if you would like them, I can send them out. And then I think we have time maybe for one, one case or two cases. Um, so this is a 19-year-old cisgender male, um, pronouns he, him, who presents for opioid use disorder follow-up and is currently taking um, Suboxone. Um, he has not used non-prescribed opioids in over a year. Um, he does say that he occasionally uses methamphetamine and 
um, via inhalation, maybe a few times a month, and it's really socially and kind of when it's around. Um, he identifies as bisexual, and he's had four partners in the past six months. His partners are cis male and transgender women. Um, he states he uses condoms like 90% of the time. He does, while he does have a history of injection drug use, he hasn't injected anything in over two years, and that was before starting um, buprenorphine. So, in addition to talking about substance use, medications for opioid use disorder, psychosocial health, you decide to kind of explore his eligibility for an interest in PrEP. So, how would you proceed? And I'm going to give you guys like a few seconds to think about it. Um, I think, again, really trying to incorporate it into a harm reduction, your harm reduction re discussion that you're probably already having with patients can be extremely helpful and a good way to to open the, the conversation. Um, you can simply ask, are you aware or concerned about your risk for HIV? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, would you like to hear about a medication that can help prevent HIV? So this patient, he's heard of PrEP. He actually has a few he has a few friends who take PrEP, and that although he no longer injects drugs, he realizes that having unprotected sex with people who may have risk for HIV um, places him at higher risk. He he really isn't ready to stop methamphetamine. He doesn't feel like it's really a problem, um, and he likes using it kind of recreationally, so to speak, to to party and sometimes for sexual encounters. Um, so you go over the different PrEP medications and kind of focus on the oral ones because those are the ones that we have access to in our clinic. And he decides he wants to start oral PrEP um, after you get labs. Um, which medication do you prescribe and what would be your follow-up plan? So the medication options for this individual would be TDF, Trivada or TAF Discovy, and that's presuming he doesn't have any renal problems or metabolic bone disease or anything like that. Um, the follow up visits are listed here again, every three days is kind of the key to remember. Um, and that you're, you're essentially going to be doing an HIV test at every three month follow up visit um, and often SDI screening. Um, and then annually, you really want to evaluate, like we do with other medications, the need for continuing PrEP um, as a component of HIV prevention using shared decision making. I'm going to go. I'm going to fly through this case because I think we have a couple minutes. Um, understanding that people, if people need to go, they need to go. Um, so, 31 year old trans female presents the clinic after a recent hospitalization for septic arthritis related to injection, drug use, heroin. Um, had successful initiation of Suboxone in the hospital with the guidance of the Addiction Medicine Consult Service. Her current dose is 16 milligrams a day. She reports using heroin a couple times since discharge a week prior um, via injection. She states that her goal is to continue to cut down on using heroin, which she has, and to eventually stop before her next birthday. She still reports pretty much daily cravings. She also has a history of hepatitis C that was treated successfully with sustained virologic uh, response. And she, as far as her kind of injection use, she um, states that she really avoids sharing needles, but occasionally does, and that she often will share other injection material, materials like cookers. So after talking, you decide to go up on her bup dose. Um, and as part of talking about harm reduction, you consider HIV risk and PrEP. So what are your what are next steps? So again, when you're talking about harm reduction, you, you ask about PrEP. Um, and which PrEP medications would be options for um, this transgender female? So really all three would be options, um, both oral medications and injectable catatag revier. And I think we're out of time. Yeah, we are. <laughs>